good morning the topic for today is about low power clock interconnect and layout designs the reference for this would be uh, the book by Southress chapter 8 and the references what you will find at the end of the chapter a lot of good materials are there in it and in the digital design practices what we had been having in the theory and the lab sessions uh, throughout the first and second semester the rules what we had been following inherently are the simplicity what are needed for the designs and which would make of course the simplicity would make the regularity possible and the regular structure would make the replication of the designs possible and the designing of a very complex circuit would be easier and smaller is faster the rule 2 what we would have is smaller is faster when you go for designing a particular uh, application for a particular application you would always choose to be making the design to be compact which would uh, help in uh, higher speed for the designs and the third rule what we had been following is learn to compromise while doing the designing whatever be the parameter which is necessary for a certain application go for choosing at the cost of something else which is not going to be so uh, important so whatever be the application based on that the good design will need some trade-offs between parameters two parameters the rule four would be make the common case work faster whatever be the common case which is going to be uh, important which is going to be at the heart of a system make that work faster and after that you have the other peripheral designs along with the main component to be working faster for example we would always whenever we talk of a microprocessor or something we would talk about the ALU what you have got inside to work efficiently and after designing the ALU next to would come the control unit program counter and all and then only you would go for the peripherals the peripherals which would work for the speed what is necessary for your particular uh, ALU so the common case if you concentrate efficiently naturally you would go for getting a good and better designs all these were discussed before before going for the topic on the clock interconnect the series concentration what we have got to put into those some recalling uh, is needed the first one is the clock tree the clock tree the simplest and the most efficient clock tree structure what we have studied i may have the clock entering from a particular point at this point i have the clock generation made and entering here from here i go for dividing that into this shape what you have is the h clock tree and you have this clock entering here this goes this way and that way thereby it is equal load and here it goes one branch another branch and here another branch second branch this way you have equal load at any point if i look at you have equal loads this is the use of your h clock tree what is famously called as h and you have all the other flip-flops latches and all these timing elements to be supplied by whatever be the clock what i get out of it so considering this to be the total chip area i have the total chip area supplied by the clock for the timing elements okay the next type the more uh, different clock architectures what you might have uh, uh, used also are what we have seen just now the edge clock tree and then the next one would be the mesh to mesh structure what i have as the clock source and from the clock source how i am taking it over in a mesh like form to the different areas across the chip the total chip area is here and this total chip area is supplied with the clock from here around everywhere and then i have another thing called hybrid in this hybrid i can have a mesh and i could have a local tree like structure what we have seen already and this is a tree structure along with cross links also so that i would have balancing of clock path 
all these are the efforts what people had been taking while designing the synchronous digital designs which would take care of the timing operation of a circuit the timing is so important and when we have the timing to be considered the major thing what we would arrive at is the clock which is the heart of a circuit heart of a chip i could say from the uh, clock source only i will have all these things entering the various areas of the chip and the clock skew the parameter what we would now go for introducing is a very important parameter clock skew and jitter we have studied already for example in the figure what we have taken i have my original clock entering at this point and the flip flops water supplied by this particular arm of the edge would be having their signals traveling all the way here up to this point whereas if i go for taking this particular thing i have here divide division and for this particular thing i have this what i have in this particular arrangement is that each and every path whatever i am taking for the clock i ultimately realize equal time at which the particular flip flop is supplied by the clock i would want to have the clock signal travel through equal paths whatever be the clock elements or we try to manage and we get the h clock tree in this manner but we cannot expect to have a uniform structure with distributed flip flops and flip flops are timing elements of the same density in each and every point i may have a total chip and within this chip i may have my digital parts here i may have some peripherals here i may have uh, some other uh, controller controlling here and i may have some interfacing here some communication uh, interface here all these would go for working with the clock and from one particular clock source i will ultimately go for making the clock signal travel everywhere and as you can see not all the particular modules are going to be supplied by the clock at the same time you will have the clock signals reaching each and every point at different timings and this is the main reason why we have the clock skew when i talk of clock skew i may have a particular clock signal and this at a particular point of the chip may enter so delayed and it may enter some other point at this time i would now have the time difference what i have here to be playing a major role as the clock skew this is what this spatial incoherence spatial disturbance depending on where the clock is originated and how long it has traveled this distance is going to be mattering and these skew are going to be so serious a thing in our uh, uh, any digital system design the microprocessors what we have are naturally supplied by or clocked by a common or a global clock signal we call it as global because it's going to be taking everywhere across and the maximum the largest difficulty is to have we need high frequency everywhere and high frequency global clock of the order of even gigahertz range now so when i talk of gigahertz range multi gigahertz range signal uh, if i want to have a 1 gigahertz i should have twice that 2 gigahertz to be generated maybe i will go for dividing this by 2 and go for supplying after shaping of course after shaping the clock signal i am sending it to the chip and at this high frequency signal when it goes through different paths and different lengths of wires and different types of loads at its ends would now be acting very very differently 
so my operation my main concern would be to let all the clock signals all the clock signals whatever i have reach all the timing elements like flip flops latches at the same time i should now go for identifying which particular path is receiving the clock early which is getting the clock late and based on them i have got to be if needed wire snaking i would make the clock to travel through a larger unnecessarily larger path just to manage the equal skew is equal uh, skew at the particular points which are under consideration and in some cases i would go for adjusting even the buffers i may want to have the clock from here reaching a longer path there and there may be a very shorter a very smaller path what i have so here i have got a unit 1 and here i have got a unit uh, 1 and 2 and i will have these two supplied by the same clock source without any skew in such a case what i would do is at this point i would add more of buffers and this would give sufficient energy sufficient uh, uh, push for this clock signal to reach it early so that by the time this signal reaches this also the clock signal also would have reached unit one so unit one and unit two would now be working in order that means i will be introducing these sort of buffers on the way in the path of the clock itself so these sort of balancing using the buffers are possible and the number of crossovers from one area to the other all these are different ways by which different tricks by which we would adjust the clock skew and these solutions what i am doing unnecessarily introducing wires and uh, redundant number of buffers all these and the crossovers all these are going to be the overheads the extra materials extra circuit what we introduce and these lead to power consumption imagine uh, how much of power actually we are spending in the clock circuitry a typical set of processors we have taken in the book also the same example though it is of 10 years old it will give you the necessary idea anyway it is for the dce alpha 21164 processor from digital equipment corporation and the clock drivers what they have used the structure that's what you are seeing now in the left what you see they are your clock buffers and these clock buffers drive the wires and the clock signal reaches this point and i may have the first part i have the first uh, first stage of the flip flop and the next flip flop i have between which i have got some logic and i will have some sequential element also some feedback element this logic i have got and this particular circuit looking at it you have something here now to see we said this is a very long wire clock is generated somewhere here and from here to cross the long length of wire with respect to the rc you have seen rc modeling and all you have studied you calculate and you find out what is going to be the total delay what is incurred in this and that delay if i in find out it seems it is around 90 picoseconds what is there what was there measured in DCE alpha the processor so what will the digital designers do they had gone for having the logic that transition delay through that logic they saw to it that it is more than whatever be the delay here that is what they had practically done i hope you follow what i am meaning to say my job so far had been to design for the functionality logic design i wanted logic design for a particular functionality that is what my concern was now what has happened a logic i have got and i have a long path for the clock to go and the clock signal is supposedly traveling a long distance and it comes across so much of skew and because of that skew in addition to the functionality what i will i would normally be bothered about i have to now bother about 
this skew also so that my transition my delay through this logic path happens to be more than what i will incur in this particular path that is the situation that was the situation even some 10 years earlier now you imagine with our udsm technologies that is because previously we were all working with the micrometer devices when i was when we were having micrometer devices this was big enough and all the nodal capacitances what we had been studying they were all uh, uh, of uh, appreciably high higher values and you had such devices to be connected by so many interconnects and all nowadays what has happened the devices have shrunk and the interconnect wires have gone increasing this is the problem what we had been many times talking about also and this particular example what we have taken for you is i have the wire and i took consideration that my logic is going to be having more delay than what i will have as the skew but even there i have taken some other additional step also what is that i have so many buffers driving this length of wire and you know how much of capacitance we have at this node point that is around 3.75 nanofarad and imagine this particular capacitance and operating at a certain voltage how much of power would it be dissipating that 12 watts power dissipation that means what we were having we were in the original uh, uh, some 10 to 15 years back we were talking about only the cv square f only for the capacitance of the nodes pertaining to the logic nowadays you have the clock power itself to be even equal to 50 percent or even more than 50 percent this is what is the reality what we have now when we have such a case how to effectively go for tackling we need to have the clock for keeping the complete system working in synchronism but at the same time we have the clock to be eating so much of power so how to effectively control them this is what is our uh, discussion also about and there is another example what we have as the etanium microprocessor in that we have a common pll which generates the main clock and maybe it will have 2 gigahertz generated and i would wave shape it and get uh, 1 gigahertz output from that and this 1 gigahertz is passed through the total clock and what they have done is the same original clock they give it as reference clock and they pass it through these things are going through the drivers and this goes through a straight simpler path and what you see here are the de-skewing clusters and the de-skewing clusters would take the reference clock here which has incurred only very small amount of delay here and the clock what had been traveling through all the paths which had been supplying also and which are uh, which is reaching reaching the particular de-skewing cluster maybe after a certain delay and the de-skewing cluster would now go for comparing these two our aim is to do what i have the total circuit with these grid structures these are the parts component areas of the chip and i would want to have all these to be supplied by the same clock without any uh, skew in between that is area this square one and another square here another square here are to be supplied by the same clock so what we do we receive the reference and the delayed clock and we de de skew that is with reference to this we are making this work and then we are supplying it to the grids whatever we have here this is what is the arrangement what they had done there in the itanium microprocessor and these type of uh, uh, circuit arrangements we have uh, at the cost of redundancy the de-skewing clusters all these are redundant but without that we cannot actually live without that anyway and the reducing 
the reduction of the clock power how can it be achieved what are the general ways and means we were just talking about uh, the clock uh, how we supply and what are the ways in which we distribute the clock and in practical cases how much of clock power is actually dissipated and all that we saw we would always not want to not to introduce any extra things like wire snaking extra buffers buffers of uh, in the previous figure what i had shown you you had this w what contributed for all these buffers was 58 cm imagine it is working it is using some uh, 180 nanometer device what we had and using 180 nanometer device they had gone for total of 58 cm width of devices imagine how much of chip area it would take and how much of power dissipation would be incurred in that that is a thing and so we go for having hierarchical clock tree on the hierarchical clock tree to and to the extent possible we would want to have both the uh, arms to be having the same clock load and the same amount of skew we felt would be there Uh, using your h and all what we had been discussing in the previous uh, slides and careful design of the clock drivers that would be the next thing what is this for the short circuit current what we will have when i go for having the clock drivers naturally whatever be the inverter i have there should not be any short circuit and this itself should not be consuming the power and we would ultimately want to have when i consider this edge clock tree here i am having some load and here i am having some load i say that and all these loads are actually what the flip flops and the latches and as far as possible try to reduce the flip flops and the latches the timing elements and even if i have got one flip flop see to it that minimum number of gates are driven by the particular uh, uh, clock signal minimum number of uh, gates of transistors individual switches to be operated by uh, the clock we have got to see to that then next to thing would be whenever i have uh, a particular uh, requirement for a uh, certain application to be operated at maybe 1 gigahertz i would want to have 1 gigahertz minimum frequency and uh, i would want to have to reduce the clock power and to increase the efficiency i may think of something like during the positive edge i can get my circuit working during the negative edge also i could get my circuit working this is what is the double edge triggered flip flops what we have uh, studied maybe in the last semester itself but which will have some other sort of problems what we will see are we can have even parallel logic modules logic at the cost of logic redundancy that is so this is what is the trading off trade off i may want to have a certain set of operations done at uh, 2f frequency or otherwise what i can do i can have two such blocks this is one particular block this can be replicated by two blocks and i can get both of these operated at ff frequencies ultimately i would have the complete uh, uh, work anyway done with but the thing is i would want to have parallelized redundant logic resources i would need otherwise what we do multi rate clocking my ultimate aim is to reduce the clock power to reduce the clock power what i can now do whichever particular module is to be operated at f whichever module is to be operated at i can offer to operate it at half of the frequency or i could offer operate at one fourth of the frequency all these i could identify and use a multi rate clock i need to have only some dividers to have f by 2 and another divider to go for f by 4 and all that and the moment i work with uh, so much of reduced frequency naturally my power dissipation by the clock is going to be proportionately reduced this is the thing what we would be following also the clock power it is a dramatic problem that is why this lengthy discussion here why the clock power can be as large as logic power and as i told it is not only 25% it could even be nearly 50% even with the current day technologies and 
the clock power self timed they are actually timing clocks what we have here if we don't want to have the clock dissipation what i can do i have one unit the moment the data from this is ready i could get my second one operating just by the use of the data identifying whether it is ready or not that is using sort of hand shaking signals what we have discussed before hand shaking hand shaking signals and they are self timed and asynchronous te techniques we call them asynchronous or asynchronous and these asynchronous techniques help in not using any particular clock at all that is one way of avoiding the power dissipation the next one would be a yeah, very good point what we are really actually following is in soc system on chip design we go for globally asynchronous and locally synchronous what is our actually problem my area of chip is very long and i have one clock generated here the reason why i need to travel all the way to reach all those places make me <coughs> suffer from uh, the particular uh, skew and all that so why to bother about let it be globally asynchronous each of the different units let them work at various frequencies within their own modules and within their modules let them be synchronous operated by a certain clock globally let it be asynchronous that is what is uh, another solution to avoid this problem of clock and in that way if we look at there is another such option also each chip would now be having different regions first region second region third region fourth region each of these would be now operating at f1 f2 f3 i hope you remember we have discussed some time about different frequency and different voltage ranges also i could have this operating at v4 v5 v6 so the first unit would be operating at v1 f1 v2 f2 v3 f3 so you will have multi voltage operation and multi frequency also this would efficiently naturally based on the particular job what is there interested with each of these blocks we would now be identifying different uh, power dissipation for each of this so whichever is the very important part go for working at a very high frequency the remaining thing you go for working at lower frequency and similarly so with if i need a very high speed see speed performance go for working at higher voltage if it is if the speed is not so important i would want only the power to be uh, the main con factor uh, which i am concerned about then go for working with lower voltage this is what is the trading of what we had discussed even at the starting and another way would be to make i have my chip around everywhere use pls and these pls would now go for taking their reference clocks and use phase detectors and those phase detectors would identify the particular clock the main clock signal and based on that they would go for deciding about they would go for uh, uh, generating the clock locally and send it through the clock tree for distribution to all the chip areas that is the another thing what we normally do nowadays for tackling the clock power problem the next thing what we had been talking about the clock the clock distribution and all that we talked about even two cases of uh, two processors how they are actually tackling the issue the next would be what we have as the clocking scheme we were so far thinking that the flip flops which are edge sensitive are the timing elements and using these timing elements we were uh, working with all the uh, circuits operated 
we had so many advantages of this master say slave flip flop structure the master would be operated by uh, the phi 1 when it would be going positive and when it this goes negative this would no more be responding to the signal whatever i have here instead the phi 2 whatever be the output was at this point would take it up and it would go for working that is what we had been studying as the master slave flip flop and the master slave flip flop frequency this is what the on time I have, off time I have from this figure itself. The on time I have, the off time I have, the phi 1 I would have uh, this working and then I would have the next time I have got this. We continue with the large based clocking scheme. The timing elements flip flop versus latches that is what we would see in this figure. Uh, the first one says the master, the next one would be the uh, slave operated by the phi 1 and the phi 2. Uh, all this we have uh, dealt with uh, earlier. We will say that this is not very robust. Why they are not robust? In the case of a latch, they are going to be level triggered. We have seen that. And I have the latches operated by non-overlapping power clocks as we have shown here. Phi 1, Phi 2 and Phi 1 and Phi 2. And because of the non-overlapping clock phases, what I have here, I always have this extra time between. This is going to be help, help me tackling the problems. How it is, we will see here how the time borrowing concept happens. In the case of a flip-flop, I have one clock uh, edge coming and by skew another clock dash what I have and the unit is expected to work because of the skew. Despite the queue, it has to get on by this positive edge. There is no other go for the circuit. So the computation time is reduced in the by this much of amount. So whatever be the frequency at which I had been expecting my circuit to operate, <coughs> if the logic is going to be taking more time, then the logic cannot be functionally correct and then I will have to rework on the logic under the frequency. This is what I will have to do if I go for flip-flop based design. The same case, if I to go for large based design, what will I do? I have the original clock or my skewed clock. I would be able to get as long as this level is on, my data could enter and I would have my computation time to be extended from this point to that point. Because of this skew, I am not going to be having reduced computation time at all. Rather, I am able to borrow extra time for this. This is going called as uh, time borrowing. We see the same figure with more uh, comparison between flip-flop based and uh, latch based here. As you see, the clock, what I have operating, if the clock had come in time. But because of the skewed clock, I have this coming early and as I showed in the previous figure itself, my computation time as related to the flip-flop, D flip-flop with the master and save slave structure, I have only this much of time. But given with the latch, latch arrangement, I have one particular latch operating with one phi and the other phi till such a point is reached. I have the computation time possible and at this difference what I have here is called the time borrowing what I mentioned in the previous slide. A better example what I have with some numbers is I have one particular logic level and I have got phi 1 the large followed by logic 2 another phi 2 logic 3 phi 3 logic 4 and phi 4. At how my uh, time borrowing is going to be effective. Let us take, I have a certain logic, what I have here, that path 1, it may be taking 8 nanosecond to complete. So what I do, my time is from here to here, 
only 5 nanosecond. Whereas, because of the facility what I have here as the latch, I may go for designing borrowing time into even the phi 2. The time of 3 nanosecond I could borrow. So, my computation for my logic L1 can start and it can extend further beyond the 5 nanosecond time what I have here and it may go into 8 nanosecond totally and this is the borrowed time from the next clock duration and for the next operation I need to have only 2 nanosecond so there is no problem when it is on I would have that operation also getting completed so my first job is done and my next job also is done and for the next thing I want to have 6 nanosecond so I will start from here for the 6 nanosecond for the path 3 it would go with this 5 and along with 1 nanosecond borrowed from here I could take and with the use of the 6 nanosecond what I have realized from here to here with the 5 nanosecond here and 1 nanosecond borrowed from this point totally 6 nanosecond I am able to complete my this job also and then I have my path of uh, uh, path 4 with the 2 nanosecond duration that I will be easily able to complete with from the next 4 nanosecond what I have. This is what is the advantage what we have out of the large based design. I could go for borrowing from the next or from the previous and I could design all these logics in such a way that I am able to get my full functionality for the logics accomplished within the total times and I would be able to have my frequency of operation to be maximally whatever is possible useful and this way it will not be possible for the uh, same flip-flop based uh, circuit because in the case of flip-flop based circuit given with the maximum time of 8 nanosecond I should have gone for all these stages 8, 8 nanoseconds duration only whereas I would need only 2 nanosecond, 6 nanosecond, 2 nanosecond unnecessarily I would be spending time and I would be introducing delays to calculate because the maximum uh, uh, delay whatever I would have through one particular logic path would determine the uh, minimum that is the frequency what I would operate for the flip flop so that would limit this is the advantage what we have out of the large based clock gating. So normally how we go about deciding the large based clock gating is by using this. We can even go for clock gating. Another terminology what we introduce is the clock gating to reduce the power and to effectively operate. We said uh, within this time it's going to be operating and after this time for 6 nanoseconds it would be operating for 2 nanoseconds it would be operating all these how are they going to be possible is by gating and sending the signals here I would have the latch based clock gating I would have my first latch and a combination logic circuit what I have shown the previous figure I have shown it in some other manner only to show that I am going to be gating as, as uh, required for my particular application and send it but only thing what we have got to remember in the case of this uh, clock gating thing is I would have these gates if it is an anti gate naturally it would be an anti gate followed by one inverter and this particular gate should not be taken by the tool for example synopsis as a circuit as a gate component which is to be optimized also so we have got to put it shouldn't be op optimized this you uh, introduce it just for the purpose of clock gating and timing the uh, sequence of data flow so this shouldn't be left optimized by left for optimization by the tool if we do it so there may be the tool may think of like how it does the optimization for the combinational circuit it would take this also as another part and it would go for placing this combinational in between or this may be taken this way nothing should uh, happen like that so when we go for designing such things the EDA tools we would have to give a don't touch attribute 
for this particular thing normally we call it as a don't touch attribute and using them we go for working the uh, timing between uh, each and every combinational logic functions for the latch based clock gating the next topic major topic what we would go for having is the interconnected delays before going for interconnected delays we have got to talk about something else also previously we were all working with the micrometer size devices and then we went for uh, uh, deep submicron what we called in the case of deep submicron we went for nanometer devices and we now call ultra deep submicron where very few nanometer here when i say hundreds of nanometers it is going to be even uh, around uh, maybe around 10 nanometer 11 nanometer 15 nanometer device 22 nanometer device all these now we are working whether it is a finfet or uh, any other uh, uh, ig fit devices it is going to be of such an order that we are working now the coming to uh, the devices how the scaling the scaling the effects of scaling have got to be uh, discussed now it is important before going for the delay of wire when we consider the delay of wire uh, we were having our devices scaled as w for the width of the device l for the length of the device and maybe uh, the thickness for the uh, oxide thickness uh, mentioned as a d now when we went for scaling we always went for uh, reduced size that we called by w by s and the length would be uh, l by s and this also would be d by s because of this what happened to the substrate doping the n substrate or p substrate doping how actually it got affected because the feature sizes got reduced we would not want the strength of uh, the or the strength of current to reduce so we would want to have within a very small feature space we would want to have more charge carriers therefore this would now be scaled by multiplied by s yes. Whereas we called here divided by s, yes, it's going to be multiplied by s. Yes. And similarly, when I would want to have the VDD, VTH, and all considered, how are they going to be? When I am having my W, L, D, and all reduced, I cannot afford to have the same VDD of 5 volts as I did for the 2 micron device given across a nanometer size device. So I will have to accordingly reduce the VDD and VTH also. So that also let us assume we are having the uh, VDD divided by S yes and VTH also divided by S. Yes. Now what in this case what happens to the current IDS? What happens to IDS? IDS as you would normally know half of beta VGS minus uh, VT the whole square I put. What happens to VGS and VT? You know we have uh, discussed here that is having 1 by S yes, uh, this one and for beta, beta is what? Beta is determined by half of your device transconductance so before that half of mu your mobility and your permittivity divided by d this factor is giving you the process transconductance multiplied by w by l give you the total thing as the device transconductance this multiplied by your vgs minus vt the whole square that's what our uh, this one is now what happens to mu it's not going to be scaled neither permittivity is going to be scaled whereas d is going to be scaled as d by s and this as w by s and this as l by s whereas this is going to be 1 by s the whole square that is what is going to be so ultimately my current is going to be 1 by s in times ids i have only one yes remaining and here one yes goes from here therefore one by s ids this one by s ids is going to be uh, the current what i have for the scaled technologies another thing what i would have is what will happen to the gate capacitance cd i would call this as gate capacitance cg what would happen to CG? Naturally, this is going to be determined by the permittivity divided by the D I into W into 
L and uh, permittivity is not going to be changing. This is going to be changing and this and this 1 by S into 1 by S divided by 1 by S. So this is going to be ultimately 1 by S also. And uh, how about the mass resistance? Mass resistance what we have whether it is for the diffusion or uh, metal wire or whatever it is. We normally call this mass resistance by the resistance what is there for a square unit of length. Therefore, this is not going to be changing. Whether it is a smaller square or the bigger square, it is going to be the same and this is not going to be changing. So, we would call it as one only. And then the next one is going to be the gate delay. When we talk of gate delay, gate delay is going to be your TD, what I would mention, C times VDD divided by ID is. So, this is now going to be how C is changing 1 by S and how VDD is changing 1 by S divided by 1 by S by which ID is, is changing also. So, ultimately this also is going to be 1 by S only. And next component what I will deal with is the power. The power is going to be what? I into uh, VDD. Therefore, this is going to be 1 by S into 1 by S. So, supposedly we are having an advantage of the power reducing by uh, 1 by S square and the density, density, what happens to the circuit density? Previously, we were having a certain size and now we are going to be reducing. So, as the size reduces, naturally by the amount of scaling, I would have the number of chips also going to be increasing. So, I would simply put it as S square. With all this, we can feel happy that we are having uh, more density and a reduced power reduction and all that but in practice is it happening so when it comes to the interconnects we were very happy that our uh, uh, devices got uh, smaller and we had power to be smaller and the voltage also less what happens to interconnect we will see from this. This is the uh, case when we had our uh, before scale we will have. Capital W is the width, the length of wire, height of wire and the distance what determines the capacitance and the delay in this case what it is we will calculate and this is the current day device the interconnects what we are using with the current day chips what we have. What we now have the same L we maintain because since because we are actually reducing the device sizes we are not making the chip wafer to be reducing also. Previously we were all working with some 200 mm devices 200 mm wafer and then we went for 300 nanometer wafer and now we realize 350 nanometer devices very coolly 3 nano sorry 350 nanometer wafer devices we are going and within that 350 nanometer device we go for taking all the number of components whatever chips possible we are able to get and this is the integration advantage what we have and this we are trying to even take it to 40 centimeter and that we are doing 40 and 45 centimeters we are uh, trying in the recent foundries. Therefore, what happens ultimately is even if we go for reducing the device sizes, we are not actually reducing the length of the wire at all. So, the length remains the same because we have more compact devices placed and more complex circuits involved in the integrated circuit naturally uh, we would have large amount of interconnects and as you know even within one particular one centimeter one centimeter uh, i read somewhere you have around uh, four kilometers to five kilometers of wire inside the interconnect length with such a case happening naturally i would go for scaling w i would go for scaling h scaling the d as i normally do for the other cases whereas i know my l only is remaining constant 
so w is w s d is d by s and therefore that delay is going to be c dash r dash is going to be into s square because of the factor s the delay okay rc the rc time constant and similarly if i compare the resistance for this case what is it going to be this is l so l times i have this l times the unit resistance and this is going to be inversely proportional to w and h and w if it is more i would have a w and h the cross sectional area if i have more naturally my resistance would be less and if this is less my resistance is going to be more the, the normal formula what we have and now as you see here w is scaled as w by s that, that is w is nothing but w by s h is nothing but h by s and this gives you the resistance increasing by s square though we use the same material we are not having the resistance to be the same the unit resistance is not actually remaining the same it goes for increasing to tell you particularly previously for a 500 nanometer technology we were having for one millimeter wire a 94 ohms of resistance value the same way if i consider uh, a 100 nanometer technology the value is around 140 ohms compare this so if i go for technology nodes less than 100 nanometer it is still going to be worser and how is going to be the capacitance varying the capacitance is nothing but your w times l divided by t what uh, capacitance i am going to be having across and this capacitance once again we will go for calculating the w is going to be w by s this w l remains the same d is going to be d by s and therefore we have the capacitance remaining the same the resistance is increased by s square capacitance remains the same and therefore the time constant what i would have in comparison with the previous case would be s square times rc now we have a problem we have the devices conducting at a particular speed whereas the interconnect that delays increasing whatever be the scaling what we are attempting the delay is increased by s square and this makes it important to go for dealing with ways to tackle the interconnect delays one such a way what not only one the practical ways by which we have started working for reducing the gate delay is by the use of from this itself by the use of uh, Mm, the material what i have here or by adjusting the d that is by suitably changing the gate oxide types what i we have as the insulator all these have led to uh, this particular graph is the product of uh, uh, one particular research what they had accomplished then the use of aluminium wire the use of copper wire and using them individually how the total delay of aluminium and copper are there as we had seen as we have discussed the gate delay for the aluminium how the gate delay as the technology shrinks is uh, this curve what you see for the aluminium wire delays and copper wire delays is this much only and the total delay of copper is this much and i have aluminium wire delays to be as i showed you already the gate delays are going to be this when i was working with a larger device the gate delay was more as i shrink down i have my gate delays to be coming low agreed it's an advantage but when i go for comparing aluminium when i worked with 0.65 nanometer the aluminium wire delay was less 
and when i worked with the latest technologies the 100 nanometer i had my wire delays to be increasing so the total delay is going to be the sum of gate delay plus aluminium wire delay and that is what you see by this graph the same way if we can have the copper replacing we have replaced the copper uh, that is the aluminium with the copper when we use copper how it is operating this happens to be the gate delay sorry this happens to be the copper wire delay and the copper gate delay and the total delay together we are drawing and this is what it is and this will tell you that for each and every type of uh, the particular foundry here I am showing you 0.25, 180 nanometer, 130 nanometer, 100 nanometer at this point of time whether it is aluminium wire or uh, copper wire I have a knee that is the point at which I have my minimum most possible delays taking into account both the gate and the interconnects into account possible whereas for this point it is this way for aluminium wire it is around 350 nanometer this is what is the work uh, what uh, had been produced this actually is to depict the effect of introducing good conducting copper wire in place of aluminium wire if we, if we would still want to reduce the wire delay even uh, some more better conductors like gold gold silver they could be used but all the same how the contamination of the oxides how uh, you have the uh, process from the process is going on all these will determine the feasibility of such an attempt and as we have discussed the gate delays and interconnect delays are so important and for each of these two metals aluminium and copper we discussed and this is about the interconnect wires how the interconnect wires we have seen the chip has grown in complexity the complexity is more and we talk of billions of transistors inside one particular chip and we even talk of system on chip which will have the complete thing here and because of that naturally the devices so high in numbers would need so many interconnections also and so many interconnect wires also we would have and this picture is what you are seeing for that this is metal 5 and 6 and this is metal 4 3 and 2 1 all these these metal wires as you see the bottom most metal how thin it is the next uh, bottom most metal one and two metal three and four its cross section how you have you are seeing here and metal five and six how big they are going to be you are seeing here metal seven eight nine ten for recent process seven eleven metal wires are there and as you see because this wire he is placed so much away from the substrate naturally the d is so long and you can afford to have very wide wires to have your resistance to be less and the capacitance is not going to be unnecessarily increasing also because of this distance whereas here i would want to have the capacitance to be less because the distance is so small so i would have my receiver my number of wires also the capacitance is less and the resistance also at this point of time you have given by this much of a bit that's what we normally do because if we have so much of thick wire naturally i would end up with more capacitance resistance if i would want to reduce i have got to have my metal width to be very big but if i go for a very big metal width naturally i would go for increased c so in the process of reducing r I am increasing C. So, this is not acceptable. Therefore, we go for uh, limiting ourselves with a certain bit for the metal 1, 2 and metal 3, 4. Whereas here, because I am having so much away from uh, uh, the substrate is so much away from this, <coughs> here it is no problem at all. <coughs> and a typical view, what you have got to see, the metal lines uh, in a 4 metal layer process, what you see from here that is the topmost metal the wires what you see the wires what you see under that you have the chip and uh, to look at it nicely 
here it is a it's a microscopic view sun expanded a magnified view what you have this is the actual chip whereas above here to the whole length you have the interconnects so the maximum area the volume of any chip is only the interconnects so imagine what it would be if we realize a 80 18 layer metal wire and how much of complex size it would be here inside and how much of cross talk play between victim and aggressor aggressors are going to be taking place and this is what is about the cross talk that is when we went for when we talked about uh, the metal wires it is a cross section i have my what uh, metal wire running like this and these faces what i have here and this face they face each other and from this layer to the substrate naturally i have a capacitance and because this is very far off i said uh, this is not so serious i said but these things are serious why i make this to be so taller because i would want to have my cross section to be high enough to bring down the r resistance and this process ultimately creates so much of side wall capacitances and area capacitances these are the things what have got to be tackled also and these are the research issues what we have with us when we go for uh, uh, interconnect theory now we talked about cross talk in the previous figure i said uh, you have a capacitance here and all these capacitors are getting only more as the technology goes down we said then what would happen because of these wires imagine i am going from here from a 0 to 1 whereas this is at 0 this 0 to 1 raise on one side of the plate naturally would go for taking a toll here so if it was going from 0 to 1 or it was going from 0 to 1 uh, or 1 to 0 naturally this is going to be affected by this this is why i call this as an aggressor and this as a victim wire and this could be a uh, yeah, victim and this could be affected by aggressor on the left side aggressor on the right side also if both are going in opposite direction no problem and if both are going in the same direction this is going to be a real victim all these are called your cross talk effects and because of this cross talk so much of uh, 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 concentration into the spacing the spacing of metal wires the drivers repeaters what go into the design are very importantly being dealt with now the ways to the normal ways followed to reduce the cross talk are very large drivers and repeaters to be less sensitive to aggressor note because even if there happens to be any strong switching action there i should have my circuit flexible enough that is it should tolerate next one would be the metal wires are to be spaced in such a manner that they don't run parallel for long distance only because i have these two wires running in parallel that i get this that is the reason why normally what we follow is if i have one particular metal layer going horizontally above this uh, uh, silicon dioxide i would have the next wire running vertical to that and then the next layer were running once again horizontal that is for example this is mi this is mi plus 1 this is mi plus 2 that way we normally arrange so that we avoid the total amount of uh, cross sections <coughs> and you can make use of the routers to take note of routing to reduce the cross talk also we should go for uh, the eda tools even while using the eda tools the cross talk the optimization with respect to the clock lay we are need to uh, bother about and the next one would be intra metal dielectric with a low k to reduce the capacitance that we can go for and copper metal lines which could reduce your r thereby i could go for reducing my rc delay itself and a larger metal lines i could go for but this larger metal line shouldn't increase the ground capacitance that we have uh, uh, discussed but it could decrease the relative coupling capacitance larger metal lines and to work at a low vdd to reduce aggression 
because only if you have a zero to a sufficiently high voltage jump that the other one would be victimized otherwise if i go for reducing this vdd naturally the effect is going to be less these are some of the ways and a mass transistor a picture how uh, the connections are being taken out the same picture the layout design these layout designs are what we will discuss in the next class because when uh, whenever we draw one particular line like this we don't get the same line in practice after the foundry produces a chip you have this disturbed lines only and what is the ways and means by which the layout design would be done would be dealt with in the next session